this week on CrossFeed. What planet is Lou Farrakhan from? How far should people go to defend the unborn? What do they need to disclose? What can you pass on to your children? How much privacy should BYU students have? Hello, everyone. Welcome to CrossFeed Religion News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> yes, welcome from the birthplace of America, you know, home of Lexington and Concord, where the Pilgrim landed, all those cool things. Good yeah. to be here tonight. Dale's had an exciting week, so we're happy for him. Ah, it's been great. We, Our congregation approved the Transforming Congregations uh, prescriptions today, so we're going to start on that process. You know, and, and uh, you know, it's been an interesting thing because um, the this whole uh, process, uh, it's it's gotten a lot of sort of bad um, publicity uh, in the Missouri Synod. Uh, there's a lot of bloggers and, and stuff talking about it and having some pretty negative things to say about it. I've read a lot of the stuff, and 90% of the problems that people have with it is based on sneezing. <laughs> Sounds like arm. Oh. <laughs> oh, glad I have a mute switch. No, you who are watching are glad I have a mute switch. Oh, just all of a sudden. Um, but uh, based on misinformation, um, so, and the, the, I was, I was talking to, um, one of our coaches who is on the board and, and I said, you know, there's, I, when I look for information online about this process, all I could find is, is all these comments against it. And, um, I said, I can't find really anything in favor of it except for churches that are doing it. And, uh, he said, yeah, that's sort of deliberate. And I went, what? And he said, well, here's the thing. We, the, the group made a conscious decision. Uh, so from early on to not waste a lot of time responding to criticism. Cause what it comes down to is there's all going to always going to be somebody that doesn't like you. And, uh, we could waste a lot of time responding to criticism or we could just focus on actually doing the job. And, um, so consequently they've just sort of let the, um, the rumors fly and don't respond to them. Um, which, you know, that's, that's, their decision, but yeah, you know, I, I just I, I've I've found it interesting since then, just because I found that it's the whole process is very steeped in Lutheran theology. Um, it's it's really a lot of it revolves around the doctrine of vocation. Um, you know, finding people using uh, using people's needs to reach the community. It's it's I mean, it's very biblical. It's very much about seeing. Uh, what uh, what are the needs in my community, and how can I meet those needs? Right. Um, but if you think the only thing you need to do is preach the scripture, preach the Bible, and administer the sacraments, and you have a field dreams mentality that you know, you know, if you do that, they will come, then you know, that's anyway. We're, I don't want to get into it. Cause Sound like I'm criticizing people, and they know who they are. Uh, so uh, maybe someone on the same planet as Louis Farrakhan. Yes. Um, <laughs> now, yeah, I'll understand. appreciate Next that. Last church, we had a Farrakhan mosque just up the road. From us. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I often wanted to go in there, but I didn't really want to be called a white devil. So you know, uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> Anyhow, so so the Nation of Islam and uh, good old Louis Fer Farrakhan are going to get together uh, out in Chicago. They're going to have um, a um, convention, their group's annual Savior's Day. And one of the topics they're going to talk about is the existence of UFOs 
And they claim that worldwide UFO sightings are on the rise. Yeah, the, I didn't realize that this is something that's very deep in their theology. Um, that uh, uh, their their uh, founder and late leader Elijah Muhammad uh, details in speeches and writings a massive hovering object loaded with weapons that he called the mother plane. And you actually uh, tie this in with the. Uh, um, well, here, uh, during last year's Savior's Day speech, uh, Farrakhan discussed in detail a vision he had in Mexico in 1985, including an object he calls the wheel. Using charts, photos, and drawings, he spent almost four hours describing how he was invited aboard, heard Elijah Muhammad speak to him. Farrakhan says the experience led him to inklings about future events. And... Uh, they, uh, he says the wheel has a great capacity destruction, but also contains the wisdom to purify the planet, but has harmed no one so far. He yeah. also claimed there have been governmental attempts to cover up proof of the wheel, which many call UFOs. Well, but thankfully, you know, groups like Journey have, you know, let the truth be out, because you know what they say. Wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Don't know where I'll be tomorrow. That's true. <laughs> Maybe that's his thing song here. I don't know. Wasn't he? I mean, I still remember his Million Man March in Washington D.C. Where he started, you know, going on was the number seventeen or something, and yeah, you know, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I, and then he, he, he you know, he. He quotes um, biblical references to the prophet Ezekiel. Yeah, the wheels, you yeah. know, with the eyes. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, those are some, some, you know, you know, if you understand Ezekiel was a priest and he's picturing God enthroned among the cherubim as a priest would, then that, all that stuff makes sense. But I don't think that's it. Actually, you know, this is really weird because, you know, people wonder what is, you know, the nation of Islam's relationship to Orthodox uh, Islam, um, and they don't, you know, Muslims as overall do not accept this group as, as being at all truly uh, Muslim. Yeah, I, I like this comment. There have been enough accounts and sightings and enough movies, documentaries made. I don't think you'd find too many people that would call it crazy. <laughs> like, like what, Independence Day? Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, Star Wars. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Anyway, um, um, I'm sorry. I, uh, now we just insulted our Jedi friends again. <laughs> Jedi, meet Louie. Anyway, um, I, I kind of got this, 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 um, what is this guy? Crazy? Um, I got a lot to laugh at this thing. This is, um, why the nation of Islam is turning more attention to the wheel isn't certain. One explanation could be an attempt to keep long-time nation of Islam followers happy after recent years during which Farrakhan has haltingly tried to move the group toward more mainstream Islam and push for the inclusion of other groups like Latinos and immigrants. She's Jimmy Jones, a pro religion professor at Manhattan Field College. In New York, um, you know, I'll, I don't, you know, I I don't know how you can even begin to say he's tried to kind of push it towards a more mainstream viewpoints on anything. <laughs> I don't know. I think they're moving more towards Scientology. <laughs> well, you know, I like Scientology extremely secretive. Uh, they don't release the number of Mosque. They don't release at least the number of membership. Um, there's a lot of splinter groups and fracturing going on within it. It says um, kind of a strange group overall. Yeah, you know, I, I remember I was down in St. Louis at uh, going to seminary when that Million Man March thing happened, which is really kind of a misnomer because what, like ten thousand people showed up for it or something like that. And it was like a hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. Okay, still quite a ways off from that, but. Um, 
but yeah, the it was you know it was, it was really a big deal. There's a lot of people you know kind of fired up about it. I remember I was at a grocery store and and uh, and my uh, bagger was black, and um, because this was a big black solidarity kind of thing, and she. I, I must have been wearing my clerical or something like that. And she asked me if I was going. And I went, um, I don't think I was invited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, anybody could go. I'm like, uh, yeah, but uh, I, I don't think I'd be too welcome. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't say that in <laughs> Louis yeah. Farrakhan's a nut job, but, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you, uh, you, 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 you mean your Mr. Steiner says, you know, welcome all white devils? <laughs> yeah. You know, so. or, 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 or ice people or whatever. But, um, well, you know, there, I mean, a lot of his message you could agree with. I mean, you know, uh, when he talked about, you know, the, the, you know, the lack of fathers in black homes and black men and stand up for the, and take care of their children and things. Uh, and be, you know, get all away from drugs, be morally responsible. I mean, we all yeah. agree with that. Right. That's natural law. Uh, that's right. That's good natural law. Uh, you know, but, <laughs> oh man, you know, somehow he just didn't talk about the wheel down there and, uh, you know, number 17 or whatever. Um, I don't know. Um, well, let's talk about an, another cult group. Let's go over to the Mormons. All right. Okay, this was like really big in the news this week. Um, the- I man, I tell you, I I would if I was this guy's girlfriend, I would feel so embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, I, I've noticed her name has not shown up anywhere. Right, <laughs> and that's good. You that's know, good. I, I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm sure everybody in the BYU campus knows who it is. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> so anyway, um, Brandon Davies, 19 She's the girl wearing the big red A on her chest. Yeah. <laughs> At uh, uh, Brigham Young University. Um, and uh, he's a, a basketball star. He's uh, their nationally ranked team this year. Going to March Madness is supposed to be good. And um, <clears throat> apparently he... Um, had a um, sexual relationship with his girlfriend, and it doesn't say how that news got out. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was kind uh, of interesting. I was wondering about that. You know, but anyhow, they have an honor code saying premarital sex is wrong, and since he broke that, he has been suspended for the team uh, for the remainder of the season. Yep. And his future at the school has yet to be determined. I think you know what the problem is just as well as so, I do. So, you know, and here's the, this is, okay, this is big news for two reasons. Number one, because March Madness is coming up, and this guy is six foot nine. All right. <laughs> Man, that's, I'm six four, <laughs> six nine. That's huge. And, yeah, uh, 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 he averages 11 points and six rebounds per game. Yeah. So yes. he's good, you know, he's going. But by the way, it says, I just noticed, it says the remainder of the season. It doesn't say anything about the postseason. This is true. <laughs> I wonder if they'll slip that in. Well, we suspended him for the remainder of the season, but we didn't say anything about the postseason there. <laughs> we'll find out. We'll try to follow up on this story. So, but, you know, here's the, I think this is news just because of the idea of repercussions for premarital sex. You know, besides the obvious pregnancy and um, STDs, all right. But the, the school would actually have a a consequence for that, and expect that students not be doing that sort of thing. Now, the interesting thing is, this sort of thing. I, I happen to know this sort of thing goes on at BYU all the time, because a friend of mine from high school went to BYU, and she told me about it. Except what they do. They they have a loophole there. Um, the Mormons at BYU will um, they'll get married and they'll have sex and then they'll have the marriage annulled. Oh, good grief! We were married. <laughs> 
<laughs> and according to her, it was pretty common practice. Now, this was, you know, um, what, 15, 20 years ago. But, uh, you know, it sounds like the sort of thing that people figure out it works and they keep doing it, you know. So it's it's not that it's not going on. It's just that he got caught. And uh, and and he's a big basketball star. You think that the magic underwear would help for something? Right? <laughs> yeah, well, unless the magic underwear has a built-in chastity belt, no. <laughs> the seer, prophet, and revelator need to take care of that right away. <laughs> Matter of fact, the seer, prophet, and revelator need to say, hey, in this guy's case, it's okay. <laughs> we need him for the team. <laughs> we need him for the team. <laughs> All right. So, so, but you know, here's the thing. You know, some people. I I, I really appreciate that this guy's not fighting it. All right, because you know, you sign on the team, you you know, and 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 they have this policy, and you agree to it. You know, whether you like it or not, you agree to it. Um. And, uh, and so if that's their policy, I've got to side with, uh, you know, with BYU on this one. Not that it's really an argument. Nobody's really arguing about it, but, um, you know, that's, that's what their expectation is. And, uh, you know, and, and so far they haven't kicked him out of school in a lot of schools, um, uh, Christian schools and, and, and other religious schools, uh, you you violate their policy. Usually it's, you get pregnant or your girlfriend gets pregnant. Um, and that's how they find out. But a lot of schools, they will kick you out. You're, you're expelled. Um, if you're found out. Or worse, expelled. So, yeah. you know, this guy, uh, of course they haven't, there's, it's still under review. I'm kind of curious what they're reviewing. <laughs> mm, how bad do we really want that championship next to his senior year? Mm. Mm, mm. University of Utah would take him in a second. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they would. Mm, so would Notre Dame. Can't have him playing for them Catholics. No, no. Can't have him losing to them. <laughs> I know, so I'm I'm sure they got something figured out there for the way I, I tell you. It, um, but it, you know, even the fact that I'm being this cynical about it. Well, of course I'm cynical about everything. But even the fact that I'm being this cynical just says something interesting about what the place of sports in our society. You know, how yeah. much serious trouble do you think they would get from the BYU boosters and alumni association and stuff if the school told him you can't come here anymore? Yeah. No, and, and you know, and that's the big thing is are they going to continue to stand by this or how far are they going to take this? You know, I mean, because yeah, sports are huge. And you know, you hear all the time about schools that have like no alcohol policies in high schools, you know, and, uh, and then somebody has a, it gets caught at a beer party or something like that and, and they bend the rules for them or, or maybe their grades aren't, um, up to the required amount or whatever. And it's like, well, or, and, or it's like at the end of the quarter, but the season's done at the end of the quarter, you know, or something like that, where they, they sort of say, well, yeah, we have this policy, but you know, it, it doesn't actually have any weight just because of the way they've set it up. You know? So, but Maybe yeah, this here prophet and revelator can redefine marriage. <laughs> hey, you know, they do, um, they do the the sort of proxy retroactive baptisms. Maybe they could do a proxy retroactive marriage. Hey, anything is possible when you can make it up as you go along. You know, it's cool. That's true. Um, well, of course, Lisa was uh, 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 heterosexual people. Uh, uh, um, time for our uh, uh, weekly gay section here, folks. <laughs> Oh man, you just can't get away from it, you know. And I know I pick out the stories, but you know these things come up. All right, so this is over in England. Uh, this is another one I jumped up that they popped up in my radar this week too, you know. Yeah. Um, well, Jim and I both being um, uh, foster adoptive parents, um, 
you know, this, this one kind of jumps out at us. This is in, in England, uh, London. And, uh, it's the, the headline is Christians lose foster ruling over gay stance. All right. Um, a couple who are Pentecostal Christians had gone to court after a social worker expressed concerns about them becoming uh, respite carers, we would say foster parents, um, after they said they could not tell a child that a homosexual lifestyle was acceptable. All right. So um, they're, uh, they're both in their 60s, and uh, they said faith should not be a bar to them becoming carers, and the law should protect their Christian values, but... The uh, the judges of the Royal Courts of Justice in London said laws protecting people from discrimination because of their sexual orientation should take precedence over the right not to be discriminated against on religious grounds. I have no idea what that meant. Um, they're not discriminating against anybody. All they're asking for is the right to express their moral and religious views. Um in the presence of a child. <laughs> you know, this is something that, um, this is an issue that we kind of deal with in uh, foster parent training. How do you, you know, what do you do if your, um, if your foster child, you know, if, say you've got a teenager or, or, or something like that and, and they say, I'm gay. You know, how do you deal with that if your beliefs are contrary to that? Right. And, and what it comes down to is you deal with it the way you deal with, with anybody else is you say, well, you know what? That doesn't change how I feel about you. I'm still going to love you. Now, as a Christian, I'm going to say, well, you know, let me help you deal with that because, you know, this is not what God wants for you. All right. The same way that I'm going to, um, deal with other things. But at the same time, yeah, it does get kind of tricky. Um, on you know how do you deal with this stuff, especially if it's a, a case where it's a, a foster child, and and um, you know you, you get into these issues of well, they're um, you can't expect them to necessarily share your beliefs and that, but you know I've got lots of friends that are gay, and um, or or that are that don't have a problem with. Uh, practicing homosexuality, right? I'm still going to tell them if, you know, if the subject comes up, I'm still going to tell them what I believe, right? I'm not going to hide that or say no comment or whatever. If, if, if they're talking about it, we'll talk about it, right? But I'm going to talk about it in love and, you know, I'm, I'm still going to care about the person and, and say, you know, I, I, I don't think this is the best thing for you, but, um, but but I still care about you. So yeah, this this whole protecting people from discrimination, like they're not being discriminated against. I mean, the the kids or or whatever. It's but it, it's a sort of thought crime. It's exactly what it is. It's thought crime. Um, as the couple said. We have excluded because we have moral opinions based on our faith, and a vulnerable child has probably now missed a chance of finding a safe and caring home. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, um, and then Andrea Manichelio Williams of the uh, Christian Legal Center and Christian Concern added, "The law has increasingly interp- been interpreted by judges in a way that favors homosexual rights over freedom of conscience." There's the thought crime right there. Yep. The fact that it's, you know, freedom of conscience. If you don't yeah. think a certain way, then you're not, um, you know, an adequate parent. Now, it's interesting because, I mean, my children, uh, when they were in foster care, their foster mom was Jehovah's Witness. You know, what if there was a religious test? Well, okay, you can't be a, uh, uh, um, um, a foster parent because you're a Jehovah's Witness or because you're, you're Lutheran or because, you know, or, or whatever his stance is, is because you think it's wrong for couples to live together or. No, this know. is, this is sort of interesting that you mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses because when we were going through our licensing here, 
one of the things that they talked about was they expect that you're going to celebrate Christmas with your foster children. Hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas, but they expect that that kids are get you know they can they basically consider the right to celebrate Christmas and to a lesser degree Halloween um, to be a, a right that that child has, which I thought was kind of interesting because I thought what and they said that they they had a, a situation once where um, they didn't say Jehovah's Witnesses but we figured it out real quick what they were talking about. Where they said, um, you know, we had a we had a family one time that said, "I'm not putting a Christmas tree in my house." And and how do we deal with that? Because these kids, you know, these kids are going to be. They were old enough that they would say, "Hey, I want Christmas presents. What the heck?" You know, and and how do you deal with that? And, and, and they raise your hand to say, "What if the kids are Jewish?" <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> It was, well, the thing is, most Jews um, celebrate Christmas to a greater or lesser degree unless they're really hardcore, you know. Uh, but, that, may, uh, that may be an overgeneralization, but like see, all the Jews uh, that my I've kids, been pretty pro-Christmas. My twins had never, could not remember ever celebrating Christmas or celebrating their birthday or celebrating um, uh, Halloween. Um, yeah, birthday presents, uh, that's another thing. They had a... Uh, uh, and the extra money that they got for Christmas and stuff, when they, they, because foster parents received that, they put into an account and distributed, the, you know, kind of bought other things for the kids throughout the year, but they wouldn't buy, spend it on just Christmas and that kind of stuff. Huh. And, uh, yeah, I was, I remember uh, our son, uh, uh, just, you know, he, he just, that just dressing up and going out for trick or treating was so cool. He just, you know, never experienced that before and stuff. And decided he wanted to wear a costume for Christmas too. He just <laughs> <laughs> Fred, if you're watching this, I'm sorry I kind of shared your secret, but you know, but what if they, you know, state of Ohio said, well, then, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses cannot be foster parents because we expect them to celebrate Christmas. Yeah, you know, is it they going again? Is that religious discrimination? I suppose it would be, unless they could. You or know. how much room does a do the um, you know do 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 you have? Yeah, you know, to yeah. You know, what if the kid coming to your pastor of your house is an atheist? And what are the expectations of your family if the kid goes to church? Yeah, and you know, and we've talked about that. And, um, you know, say we got a, a, a kid who, um, for instance, was, uh, was, uh, Jewish. All right. So, um, so then what do we, and they, they don't want their kid going to church and, uh, and they want him going to synagogue. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we would have to arrange for somebody from the synagogue to come and pick them up or, or we could take them and, and, you know, find somebody to, to take care of them while they're there or whatever. Um, and, uh, and have to find somebody to watch them while we're at church, you know, and, and we've talked about that, that, well, we'd have to work something like that out, but it'd be pretty difficult. So, you know, it would definitely, in our case, it, it, it would, it would have to be something where we'd have to, um, if at all possible, it, it would definitely be better for us if we were able to bring them to church, you know, and in most cases it's not an issue, um, you know, but, uh, cause the parents don't really care, but, uh, and, and in fact, most parents probably figure, well, it's probably good for them, you know, but at the same time, yeah, you get these situations with some of these fringe groups, um, and and nowadays this you know belief about homosexuality uh biblical belief is becoming more and more considered fringe even though it's a mainstream you know standard christian biblical belief um what it comes down to is they should still be allowed to express their beliefs okay um but like taking using the example of jehovah's witnesses 
if you say, well, I'm not going to have, you know, Christmas in my house or whatever, then, uh, you let the, the, uh, social worker or somebody like that take them to a Christmas party somewhere or something like that. So that even if they can't celebrate it with their foster family in their foster home, they still get to have that celebration, that experience. All right. So that at that point, the family's not, you know, endorsing a, a practice that they don't believe in. At the same time, um, they're allowing that child to practice a, um, you know, you could say a cultural um, belief or a, you know, it's it's part of our sort of American um, cultural religion in a sense. So it's a you know it's a compromise, but that you know I can understand uh, um, Joe's witness not wanting to have um, you know a Christmas tree in their house, or to give Christmas presents, or or to have birthday parties and things like that. At the same time. Um, you know, for most of us, that's a pretty big deal. And, uh, you know, so and we would consider that, boy, that's really being mean. I mean, when we had long-term foster kids in our house and we were close enough to family, um, I mean, our, my parents, my wife's parents, or, you know, brothers and sisters, they all came to our house and brought, you know, birthday presents and stuff for our foster kids and that we had a full blown birthday party, made them a cake and you know, the whole thing. Um, and, uh, now it was convenient in our case that it, the birthdays corresponded with some of our birth kids. So we can kind of put the things together, but it was, it was understood that this is a party for both of them. It's not sort of, well, it's, it's this one's party and we're also, it's the other one sort of too, you know, they're when they're with us, they're our kids and, and so we, they have all the same rights and privileges, you know, their family. And, um, so yeah, it was, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, it, you know, it, it almost, this, this sort of discrimination, um, to the point that it's getting, it really kind of reminds me of the, uh, the number of the beast, uh, in Revelation where, you know, anybody that doesn't have this mark is, is, uh, kept from commerce and, and things like that, a full participation in society, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like that. I'm not saying that this is the number of the beast or something like that, but, um, there's certainly a parallel here. Um, and, uh, but something else about this story that really jumped out at me is that this is in England where the state church is Anglican and the state church teaches that practicing homosexuality is sin. Not to be confused with the American Episcopal Church, which is really almost like a fringe group of the, um, of the Anglican Communion. But the official teaching, my understanding is that the official teaching of the Anglican Communion is that homosexuality is sin. And so for this to be going on in a country for whom this is their state church, this is the official teachings of their government. And so they're kind of contradicting themselves. But it kind of shows what happens when you have a state church tends to, you know, the government kind of, you, you get so much confusion of church and state that it, it sort of loses its effectiveness. It jeopardizes my ability to effectively govern this student body. So. Yes, it does. Well, we're going to end the stories this week with two stories on the topic of uh, abortion and pro-life. Um, now one of these is, uh, let's, let's we'll start with, uh, the Huffington Post, or I'm sorry, the Huffington Host, uh, as, uh, James Toronto said, calls it in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, um, 
they uh, um, I'm kind of very. I mean, I don't even say what to say. I mean, it's not even. It's so slanted. It's it's. it's <laughs> oh, I don't know. Funny. I don't know. I think that the second story from the New York Times is even worse. <laughs> but we'll get to that one in a minute. Well, yeah, you'd expect that from the New York Times. Well, you expect it from the Puffington Host, too. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's just very frustrating, both of these. Um, so this is right in my backyard. Well, not quite. Down the road a little ways, down in Columbus, where apparently there's more protests going on than just the teachers that, um, and all the union stuff that we've imported from Wisconsin. Um that's where they brought you in from Wisconsin. Ah, <laughs> you're one of those rabble rousers. Okay, I oh, went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. It all adds up now. Okay, <laughs> my stepmom works downtown Madison. <laughs> yeah, she's just loving it. <laughs> all the chaos down there. She's out there protesting, huh? Okay. No, no, <laughs> not exactly. She, she swings pretty conservative. <laughs> And that's an understatement. Oh, so, okay. Anyway, um, oh, just the way that you know, uh, um, that this is worded, it just really frustrates me. But um, uh, uh, um, I mean, the fact is, some pro life groups are, are 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 really have hit some major blows lately. Uh, beginning with uh, Lila Rose and uh, her, uh, I can't remember the name of the organization she works for offhand. Life TV or something like that, and her stings of uh, abortion clinics, um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, and then um, there was a billboard uh, up in New York City which declared, um, which said, you know, something about I can't the remember most again, dangerous Justin place for an African American is in the womb, right? Because forty percent of uh, African American children are aborted in New York City. And right. uh, so it's yeah. And know, the article says that uh, many blacks complain the billboards are offensive and perpetuated stereotypes. Planned Parenthood called it a condescending effort to stigmatize and shame African American women. No, that wasn't it at all. It was, it was to show. A fact. It was the point of those billboards was to show that Planned Parenthood. I mean, the founders of Planned Parenthood were racist, and they deliberately set up their clinics in black neighborhoods to try to abort as many black babies as possible. That's a fact. That's right. Uh, that's exactly what Margaret uh, Sanger is. Um, and then the third thing that they object about is that down there in, in Ohio at a uh, hearing in the Capitol, they had um, women with the ultra, having ultrasounds and stuff before the Senate or, or House uh, uh, Investigative Committee uh, that's uh, debating this bill and showing, hey, look what we're talking about here. We're talking about a real, a real person sitting there kicking around. Uh, and here's the heartbeat, because what they want to do is they want to restrict abortion. Um, you know, you cannot have re an abortion after the heart is be definitely beating. Right. Now the uh, the article is contending that. Um that it's going to be unconstitutional because of Roe v. Wade, which says it's um, when a fetus is viable. And then, of course, we have what's that? I can never remember the name of the other one that made any time up through birth. Roe v. Dal Dalton. There you go. No, Do Doe v. Dalton. No, yeah. Or Doe v. Bolton, something like that. Something like that. Um, but uh, so, yeah, it'll probably get sh shot down. But, you know, there it says uh, at the front of a hearing room, each woman wearing a uh, concealing gown had her belly rubbed in a conductive gel and a nurse then rolled the wand over to produce the ultrasound image. In other words, she had an ultrasound. That's how an ultrasound happens. All right. Um, the grainy, ghostly black and white picture, <laughs> I guess that's descriptive, um, was projected onto a big screen with the quivering heart highlighted in vivid colors. The gentle lub dub of the heart could be heard over the room sound system. Uh, <clears throat> Ducia Ham, executive director of Pregnancy Counseling Center in Ashland, Ohio, highlighted the picture with a laser pointer. Um, so, you know, their, their point is, and this is, I mean, and they're talking about, you know, sort of in-your-face, over-the-top tactics, right? They're trying to make a scientific point here. 
you know, take a look. Just be educated right. about what you're talking about. And yeah, is it emotional? As, yeah, it's, we're talking about human beings being killed here. It's emotional. You know, if you're not moved by emotion, then I suppose, you, you know, if, if this is just a ball of cells and, and it's no different than, you know, a tumor, then it shouldn't be emotional at all. If you're moved uh, I noticed by it. One thing I, I'm looking for here, uh, I noticed they don't have any, um, don't talk about the abortion clinic in Philadelphia. Where the guy was found to have just been, yeah, it really was just about almost a mass murder. Had, you know, botched all these things and, and was still being sent clients from Planned Parenthood. You know, mm. and it was, you know, a filthy, unhealthy mess, but nobody wanted to go deal with it because it was a abortion clinic. Uh, and who wants to get involved in that whole thing? Uh, so I imagine it's, it's interesting that, you know, I was talking about all these, these, these things that they say are dirty tricks and, uh, this, this, this thing she, uh, they, you know, the, uh, not raw pro-choice says Ohio's is a, that's a circus. Well, you know, uh, 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 where's, uh, where's the other story about Philadelphia? I don't know. I, I look at this and go, why are you quoting Narrow? Okay. They're lobbyists, right? I'm sorry, but if you're a lobbyist on either side of the aisle, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> right? Um, especially groups that exist, you know, purely for lobbying. You, you know, or, or okay, I'll, I'll hear you out, okay, but I'm going to take your bias into account. And when you make a, a statement like it's a circus, all right, to you, all right, but at the same time, you know, it's trying to point out a scientific fact that this is a living human being. Um, I, well, I, I like the person who says, uh, yeah, we saw the beating hearts of these babies and hopes the legislators will allow these babies' hearts to beat, uh, said Janet Fogel Porter, executive director of Faith to Action. That's the point. There were no three rings. So I'm kind of in the circus because, you know, it wasn't there. Uh, the other one I like is, um, uh, they're complaining about live action. That's, uh, Light of Roses group. And, uh, we're, now a few years ago, um, Lila Rose looks much younger than she really is. And a few years ago, she had a she went into a, a abortion. Several um, Planned Parenthood clinics said that she was uh, 14 and she needed an abortion, and the, the the father was like 26 or 27, and had all these people on tape saying, "Well, we'll just we'll just write down a different age for you. Uh, don't say anything about his age." Because that could get into a lot of trouble. Basically covering up statutory rape uh, and all kinds of things. And well, now she's gone in again. And Anyway, so now, following the uh, two who hit the um, uh, Acorn groups last year, um, she and a friend of hers dressed as a pimp and a prostitute and said they are setting up a brothel and they are going to bring in underage girls from El Salvador and things. I mean, and, and once again, they, you know, got people on tape in several clinics telling them how to cover up the, uh, the age, uh, how to get them social security numbers, how, how to do all this stuff that need, you know, you would need to do, all of which would be highly illegal. Um, and, um, you know, and, uh, t I, I actually love this because, uh, you know, once again, these are dirty tricks, you know, <laughs> to do something like this. So that's an expose. Well, we <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if you, if, you know, if you, if what you just, just show that was, well, this, you know, that they don't really do this. No, actually, it says that they fired one of the uh, clinic directors. But, right. You know, that's kind of an admission of guilt right there. Yeah. That's a sting, uh, people. All right. <laughs> and uh, you could call it a dirty trick, but it's a sting. All right. Yeah. You're busted. And I like this. It says, and they complained to the FBI. Um, Author and the FBI said what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I could call the FBI and complain. It doesn't mean that my complaints have any merit. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, um, obviously they didn't. Um, yeah. And that, that, see, that's actually one of their, their things that they put. 
oh, well, you know, when this, when this happened, we, we called the FBI right away and they found out, well, no, it hadn't. Um, you know, they didn't do it for some time. So I, I thought that was an interesting quote. It says, uh, I think the pro-life movement has probably had the upper hand in the last several decades in the production and dissemination of these images. I'm not sure I can say why. Uh, this is from Ziad Munson, Associate Professor of Sociology at Lehigh University. Uh, she said, I would assume many in the pro-choice movement would agree with me. They haven't been as successful in marshalling these images to their advantage for whatever reason. reason, right? Because these images of human beings in the womb are pretty hard to argue with, right? How can you show a human being with a beating heart and say, see, <laughs> you know, like, right? This is evidence they're trying to work against, but the evidence is still there and the evidence is undeniable and it's pretty hard to refute obvious truth, right? right. That's why whenever you hear arguments, it's all about the woman's rights, the woman's rights, all right? They've, any, anybody with any scientific knowledge at all, all right, I mean, and I'm talking like a third grade, maybe fifth grade um, scientific level of knowledge. If you say, is that um, whatever you see there, is that alive? All right, well, let's see. What are the, um, you know, what are, what are, what's the basis by which we call something alive? Right, able to reproduce. Yeah, it's reproducing cells. All right, um, and and you don't have to be. You know, that's what able to reproduce refers to. Not necessarily fertile. Obviously, somebody who's infertile is still alive. Okay, um, able to grow, um, able to uh, movement. Um, you know, these these sort of basic. Uh, I can't think of the other things, but yeah, you know, these the, the sort of very basic uh, concepts of, of what it means to be alive, taking in nutrients and, and things like that. Um, this is, that's alive, okay? You can argue about whether that's a person with, with civil rights, okay? And that's sort of where the, the argument has gone because the whole argument about whether that fetus is alive or not, um, yeah, the science textbooks, as soon as they start defining life, sort of refute the argument. So, um, yeah, so the next question is, is that a person? Is it, you can't even say, is it a human being? Because the set of chromosomes sort of answers that question, right? Um, and, and so then you get into the question of, is this a person? Is, you know, do they have legal rights? Well, I don't know. There was a time in our country where there was another group of people that um, that were argued to be, even though they were human beings, were considered something less than humans, right? No, um, they were always considered human, but they were not persons. Right. The U.S. Constitution, it's written to cover persons. Right. That's the issue. It, it And you really, you know, you cannot, I don't know, any person out there who can argue whether or not an unborn child is a human being. But legally, the question is, is that still a person? You know, you get uh, Pete Singer down at um, Princeton who wants to say that you're not really a person until you're two years old. Mm -hmm. One or two. I mean, you know, and, it, you know, why? Well, there may be something wrong with you. And so, you know, and the reality is, by devaluing life before birth, the fact is there's going to be a devaluing of life on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going, you know, and these people who, you know, are, are you, you think you're pro-choice now, just wait till your kids get to choose. You know, and uh, say, well, yeah, you know what, it's too much trouble, we're just going to, we're just going to get rid of them, you know, just to you know, already over in Denmark, you know, in the Netherlands, a lot of elderly people don't want to go to the hospital because they're afraid they won't come home. Yep. And it's not yeah. that they're afraid of being going to a nursing home. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. I no, mean, it's scary. And, I, you know, for that matter, all right, I've mentioned this before on the show. I'll mention it again. 
back when our president um, was a uh, Illinois senator, he uh, um, was in favor of, um, I always forget the term, but uh, basically post-birth abortions, children that survived abortions, and that they would just uh, put the, this born baby in a closet somewhere to die. He was in favor of that. He voted in favor of that. He spoke in favor of that. It's not just that it was something on a on a bill that was sort of hidden on page 137 of the bill or something like that. That was the meat of the bill, and he was in favor of it. He got voted down. All right. Notice that was not one of his platforms when he ran for president. All right. But it's reality. David knows babies and the soft spots on their heads. Did you watch the Onion News Network the other night? <laughs> I, I, I've subscribed to the podcast, but I'm way behind watching it. Why? Oh, they announced the news that they found President Obama. He'd been kidnapped by an imposter within hours of being inaugurated. And <laughs> answer the question how this inspiring person could become this mealy mouth middle pushover that they've seen for the past two years. And... President Obama was really upset because he said, how can anybody think that person was actually me? <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> Understand, though, folks, if you've never seen The Onion, they're an equal opportunity insulter. Yep, yep. They go after everybody. You know, it was, but it really was very funny to watch. Okay, so maybe, maybe you know, maybe you're Onion fans like I am, you know. Wait, hold on. Uh, we didn't do the... The pregnancy uh, you know, but I'll throw it in now. You, you can write to us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. Okay, so now we go to... The Onion the... started at the University of Wisconsin, by the way. That was the only campus paper I ever read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to New York. All right. So this is... Wow. It, I'm sorry, but like, if you ever want to... If you ever want to argue against a... um. A, uh, that the the media is leans to the left. At least the New York Times. If you ever want to say that the that the New York Times is fair and balanced, you've got to read this article. <laughs> right. So um, the city council favors pregnancy center disclosures. Uh, passed a bill on the New York City Council passed a bill on Wednesday seeking more transparency from crisis pregnancy centers that present themselves as medical clinics. But the critics say offer little more than pregnancy tests and counseling intended to deter women away from abortions. Right. So uh, according to council speaker Christine Quinn, the goal of the bill is to ensure that women are fully informed and not deceived. Women need to know they have a right to know whether they are consulting with a licensed medical provider. All right. So what we're talking about here are these sort of, if you, if you look in the yellow pages, um, if you look under abortion, you'll see first before that under before abortion, you'll see in the yellow pages abortion alternatives. All right, and and these are the places where um, you're you're it's a sort of what we call a crisis pregnancy, right? And you're considering an abortion. You go to this place, and they're going to counsel you not to have an abortion. All right, the same way that if you go to Planned Parenthood, they're going to counsel you to have an abortion because they're going to make money off of you. Whereas crisis pregnancy centers tend to operate on, um, on donations and, and fundraisers and things, and they provide everything for free. Um, and uh, and the crisis pregnancy centers don't tend to get uh, money from the government, uh, whereas Planned Parenthood does. Um, never really understood that because then they just feed the money right back into the government through lobbyists. But anyway, sorry. Um, so I okay, these centers they said offer ultrasound exams, exams and outfit their employees in medical scrubs, but do not provide licensed medical care. Sometimes they said a center is set up right across the street from a Planned Parenthood clinic. It's like it's like holy ground or something. Um, Councilwoman Jessica Lappin, who represents parts of Manhattan, said she first became aware of such centers about a year ago and began drafting the bill. I read about them and thought they couldn't possibly exist in New York City, she said. But I did a little research and found out that they 
did. Actually, we are two laboratory mice. Are you a city councilwoman? <laughs> what kind of dits are you? <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, but I, this just floored me. <gasps> I mean... They yeah. walk among us. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know they exist until a year ago. Well, you know, I never heard of them. You know, it kind of reminds me of the um, uh, the Hollywood producer that, that was asked by you know somebody, a, a Christian in Hollywood, yeah, how many people go to church? And he said, I don't know, you know, maybe a couple percent of the people. No, every year, every week, forty percent of Americans is that they they're in a church or they belong to a church or synagogue, one or the other. He goes, well, if that's true, how come I don't know any of them? Because <laughs> you're a Hollywood producer. You know, it's the same, the same, same thing here, you know. Um, you notice what they don't do is put a, they don't identify her um, political party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've... I've... <laughs> It's yeah, it's it's def, it's not clear from the article, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, sorry about this. I know it's a bit no. silly. I, they yeah. must have come off of fair guns. You have yeah. and then, or something. Then uh, our buddies there, Nara Pro Choice New York, released a report saying it found crisis pregnancy centers in the city using deceptive tactics and false claims to dissuade women from having abortions. Um, what? No video? You know, I mean, you know. Well, no, actually, they use ultrasounds and say, that's your baby. <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh, um, that's deceptive. They show that that this baby has a beating heart. <laughs> Sometimes it, it's to the point where there's little hands and feet. <laughs> Actually, I mean, some of, you know, many of them, I, you know, the, at least the, in Rockford and in Springfield, the two that I, you know, I would associate with, uh, they did have, you know, um, licensed nurses, you know, staffing it, uh, on a volunteer basis. And if, you know, you wanted to go through with the pregnancy, they would help you find a licensed doctor. I mean, they're not doing anything really medical. Right. Yeah. You know, they're, they're offering counseling and, you know, it. and support. Got, yeah. You know, but here's the thing. We talked about this. Um, I, I, I kind of preached not on this, but, um, when we had our, uh, sanctity of human life Sunday, uh, was it last month? Um, a couple months ago, I guess it was January. Um, but, uh, I, I read a, a story. Uh, from someone who had had an abortion. And she talked about how, in fact, it was somebody who had had an, uh, one child she had had aborted and another child she had given up for adoption. And she talked about the difference that with abortion, it's all, I mean, she has just tremendous amount of guilt because of it. And, um, and, and it was n nothing good came of it. It was just all, destructive. Whereas with the child that she gave up for adoption, you know, here she gave this family a child that they desperately wanted to have. Um, she gave this child a home. The child is happy. Nowadays they have open adoptions so that you can, you know, stay in touch to a greater or lesser degree, you know, get pictures. Um, usually if, you know, at the very least, um, you can get, you know, annual pictures of the child or, or something like that, you know, so that you can at least have, know how the child is doing and stuff. And, you know, in, in some cases you could, I mean, in some cases the, the mother is just sort of a friend of the family and, and the child can, will even grow up knowing that, yeah, that's my birth mom, but, um, but she couldn't take care of me. And, and so this is my, um, uh, you know, they say real mom or, or, you know, whatever. And, um, and, you know, there's just, there's no reason to, to have an abortion, um, you know, except in very extreme medical situations. And, you know, what these groups do is they provide the counseling and, and whatever services that these women need to help them through their pregnancy, 
to turn what is a very difficult, negative uh, situation into something very positive. Something that instead of regretting and, 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 and sort of saying what if for the rest of their lives, they can walk away from it, you know, when, when all is said and done, it can become a very positive thing in their life that they can feel very good about, right? That's what these groups do. And yeah, boy, can you believe there's these sort of things in New York City? <laughs> good! <laughs> Yeah, it'd be interesting opponents say that Ms. Lappin's legislation violates free speech rights and that it's similar to a Baltimore measure that was recently struck down by a federal judge. Uh, so we will find out because as, you know, the, uh, one of the city councilmen who voted against it said, when you target speech, it's inherently you know, unconstitutional. Yeah. What they're talking about here is that, like, when someone comes in for their services, like, they have to, like, read them some sort of prepared statement or something like that, you know, that sort of comes across, you know, you, you got this woman in crisis and you say, all right, I want to help you, but first legal, I, I have to read you this ridiculous statement, you know, and, and it just gets in the way of, of trying to help somebody, you know, it's bad enough that they have to, you know, sign some sort of disclaimers and, and things like that. But, um, you know, or, or depending on what the situation is, there's always sort of legal things that you need to do to for insurance reasons or whatever. But you know, it you've basically they're trying to neuter these groups, right? Well, yeah, I like the the end of this. Uh, Donna Donna Lieberman with the New York Civil Liberties Union um, said it, it. It you know it doesn't violate speech, free speech rights. It's not viewpoint based. It's about deception. Unlicensed ideologues have the right to be ideologues to espouse their beliefs, but they don't have to, the right to dress up as doctors and masquerade as health care providers and deceive women into thinking they've been to a doctor when they have not. Now, I, you know, I don't know anybody. See, okay, show the video. We've got video showing, uh, uh, Lila Rose has video showing uh, of abortion providers you know, giving advice, taking care of underage girls and lying about it. So why don't you guys have video of these people uh, saying that they're doctors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because someone yeah. puts on scrubs because they're, you know, want to be clean when they're um, helping women, you know, doing the ultrasounds and things like that and want to keep a clean environment, <laughs> which is probably a whole lot cleaner than a lot of abortion clinics. Like the um, one in Philadelphia? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so you know, they're just wanting to be, be clean and protect them. I, you know, from my experience with these groups, they, they're they not pretending to be something they're not. Right. I've never met known anybody there who said, you know, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I do play one on TV. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, but I do play one in here. You know, I've never met anybody, you know, who. No, they said, you know, I'm not a doctor, um, you know, uh, or I am a licensed nurse or, you know, whatever I am. I'm a licensed, you know, ultrasound technician, you know, but they've never, I've never had them, you know, the, you know, deliberately lie and she, you know, about who they are. Right. Um, so, if, I mean, if, if someone actually is being deceptive, if they're lying about it, I mean, for one, yeah, wrong. yeah, that's wrong. Okay. The answer that, that's already illegal. Me. Right. Okay. You don't need a new law on that one. You right. just need to. If you've got evidence that they have deliberately misrepresented themselves, which is called practicing medicine without a license, uh -huh. then, then send, send, you know, send them out. But no, this, this is going to go nowhere because it is stuff. But, um, anyway, again, your comments, your thoughts, you can send them to us at crossfeed at, uh, yeah, podcast at crossfeednews.com. If you, <laughs> I was just thinking about, you know, finding a Wi-Fi spot, uh, you know, across the street from a Planned Parenthood um, facility and <laughs> podcasting from there <laughs> would, you know, if I'd get uh, sort of bad juju or something. <laughs> Holy ground. Bad, <laughs> bad juju. <laughs> Lots of bad juju. 
So, hey, God watch over you all. Take care of you. Have a wonderful week in his grace. Yep. Oh, uh, got a shout out. Week. Oh, Hold on. Yep. Uh, shout out. I got this cool bracelet on. Um, friend Jason, who's a member of our church and is on leave right now from Kuwait. Uh, I was in church today. I was really happy to see him. Um, he's, he's one of our viewers. And uh, so imagine um, Jason, the hope that you had a chance. He's probably watching this way later than we recorded it because the Internet over in Kuwait really stinks. And um, so he hasn't a lot of been able to. in Kuwait really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, you know, he hasn't been able to um, to watch in that because of the, the Internet's so bad over there. So I hope that you've been able to load up your iPod you know, with, with these, um, episodes and give you something to do over there. So, um, so a big shout out and a big thanks, um, to you and to everybody else, uh, that's serving our country in the military. So, so that's all I've got. So good night, everybody. God bless. God bless.